Hello, gorgeous. It is yours truly, Lala Kent, with my sidekick, ride or die, badass motherfucking bitch. What's up, Jess? What's up, everyone? Wow. We just had Thanksgiving. How was your Thanksgiving? My Thanksgiving was awesome. Okay. So my little brother came into town. It was just me, Easton, my mama, Ocean. We had the best time. Mm -hmm. It was hysterical because, you know, we're like in this new place and we're fixing Thanksgiving and everything in my new place, I call it the safe house, is completely brand new. And before we moved in, they said to us, keep in mind, everything's brand new. Mm -hmm. So things may like you may look at something and be like, oh, this isn't working. Well, the oven doesn't completely shut. So it just stays on, like the burner stays on. Stop. Like yes. preheat. Yeah, yeah. So everything was like, <gasps> <It's so crazy>. <laughs> <laughs> So we basically prepped our entire Thanksgiving dinner in our, what is that thing called downstairs? What thing? The air fryer. <gasps> we prepped. Oh, and it was the Stop. best Thanksgiving meal ever. Lala loves her air fryer. So I'm sure that was like your your Thanksgiving meal. That was the best one you've ever had, maybe. It was the best one I've ever yeah. had. And keep in yeah. mind, I'm obsessed with the air fryer because my mom and Easton are like obsessed with the air fryer. And I was like, fine, like I'll get a fucking air fryer. Yeah. Thank God for it. <laughs> We made the beans in there. We made the sweet potatoes in there. Like Are everything. you serious? Yeah, it was five stars. That's actually amazing. And also, I told Lala, I was like, this Thanksgiving, you're in a brand new house. Like, you moved everything in. Just go out to eat. But obviously, you did not do that. You guys went. You went for it. You we actually, went for it. That's amazing. We fucking went for it. Because Kyle and I did not. Well, you were supposed to cook on Thanksgiving. That's like your thing. I didn't. We went to the Bellagio for Thanksgiving dinner with How his dad it? and mom. It was great. It was really great. It was beautiful. It was relaxing. It was decorated for Christmas. So it was great. But I'm kind of like it was great. Next year, I'm going to cook. Next year, you're going to cook. See, yeah. You live and you learn. Yeah. I remember there was a year that my mom took us to this place in Utah called Bambara. And mm -hmm. it was like all. Keep in mind, you guys, we're recording this podcast <laughs> in my bed. And there's like leaf blowers outside. So yeah. they're starting up again. You can yeah. hear them. Yeah. This is real life, people. Welcome. This is real life. Welcome to the safe house. Welcome to the safe house. But I remember sitting there and it was like all this seafood and stuff. And I love seafood. But I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And the worst part about going out, mm -hmm. there's no leftovers. That is true. That is something I miss. See, the leftovers are the best part. Did you have leftovers this year? We did. Okay. So let me let me explain something to everybody, though. I have been incredibly stressed out. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine why. <laughs> I've literally lost. I just got weighed at the doctor mm -hmm. and I have lost over like 10 pounds Oof. because I'm like just my stomach. Every time I put food in my mouth, it just feels like I'm going to vomit. My stomach is just in knots mm -hmm. and I'm trying to work through it mentally. It's yeah. not that I'm not eating because I don't want to, but mm -hmm. I have when certain things happen to me, I have a visceral reaction to them. My body responds in a way where it's like not hungry. Right. And so I, I having to force feed myself right now when my mom is like, you're eating this. And it's yeah. it's difficult because oh, I yeah. just have a lot on my mind and I'm doing a lot of things. I'm trying to work. I'm a single mom. Mm -hmm. All amazing. But I didn't back to off the heavy topic yeah. and back to <laughs> I did have leftovers. I didn't eat as much as I usually would. OK, but I, I definitely was eating leftovers right right yeah. the good thing is is when my appetite comes back mm -hmm. oh she comes back <laughs> she's like where's the chocolate cake right. where's the wings where's the deep fried chicken she comes back and she honey. comes back honey so i will yeah. welcome her whenever she's ready to come back right the I one thing that. i'm worried about though jess is my what? reunion is coming up friday and i have a dress oh. but is it gonna fit and or is wardrobe gonna have to pin me up that's the Vanderpump Rules reunion, I as know. everybody knows. It's so great. Yeah, that's true. Your dress, though, there are two options that Lala's choosing between. They're both gorgeous, and I think either one you'll make work. Should I spill some tea? Spill the tea. Okay. 
fun, fun fact. Okay. So I had this interview look that production went crazy over. Mm-hmm. I found out about the pictures of his name we shall not mention and mm-hmm. the Nashville girls. Mm-hmm. I decided on October 20th, the day of my book signing, that I was going to change my tattoo. Yes, you did. that to brand new. Mm -hmm. Well, because my outfit for the interview look had never been, it hadn't been worn yet. Mm -hmm. And I had an interview coming up and it didn't have sleeves on it. And I was like, I have a new tattoo that I cannot reveal yet. So we need to make sure, because I didn't know when they would use this interview look. You know, I'm like, they could pop it in tomorrow and it could be on this next episode and I cannot have that happen Mm -hmm. so I wore the same dress that I wore at my book signing to do the interview look it's like that cute little pink one hair in the bun feeling chic yeah production was super amazing about it they were like we totally understand and now they've actually their number one pick for my reunion look yeah is the dress that I was gonna wear in the interview and you get to wear yes and you guys it's absolutely gorgeous and now you're rocking the brand new tattoo with the brand new tattoo is such a vibe such a vibe it's gorgeous and not only is it a vibe it is now on my merch merch. it's just such a fun thing to say like i'm brand new like it's so yeah and it's in my handwriting and i am brand new like Mm -hmm. i feel with everything that's going on like my mind is right right yeah you know i've never yes I've never felt that you are more at peace, at ease, more of a boss ass bitch, boss ass bitch than you are now. Um, but speaking of spilling the tea, yeah, Lala, I'm curious. So you mentioned the Vanderpump Rules reunion is filming this coming Friday, yes. which will be December 3rd. Will you spill tea? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I think there are certain things that can be discussed Mm -hmm. and there are certain things that go a little deeper that, you know, I will answer to the best of my ability. Okay. But, you know, unfortunately for me, my head has been in the sand. I don't know how the fuck I didn't see a lot of this shit. Right. And some of my comments and my meddling in other people's relationships, I don't know if it was a projection. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. All I know is a lot of things that I said and things that I, you know, meddled in, Mm -hmm. my comments didn't age well. Right. And I'm okay with that. Okay. So I think a lot of it is going to be talking about that Mm -hmm. and having to answer for a lot of those things. And you know, I'm I'm big on accountability. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. don't like thing. I don't when I behave a certain way, this, that and the other. I'm a firm believer in the universe has always held me accountable. Yeah. So and it's made me have to sit here and and face things and be truthful and honest. And with all of that, I'm grateful for because I lay my head down every single night and I know that I am a good person, Jess. You are one of the best people I know. And I'm not. That's very sweet. I know that I mess up sometimes, but I am very proud of my evolution. And Mm -hmm. I'm, when I look in the mirror, I know like that I was, that I am a good human being. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it should be. You're a great person. You're people see you. This is how I feel because I was one of those people. I saw Lala and I was like, oh, she's a badass businesswoman. Look at her do this. Look at her do that. And then you meet Lala. And then within such a quick amount of time, you're like, oh, oh, this person is so much deeper than I thought. And then even, you know, a couple weeks later, I'm seeing Lala say things and do things on her own accord, not thinking anyone's watching or listening for other people that no one will ever find out about. And she just does them out of the good of her heart for other people, for animals. And it's just like, oh, this is a good person. I appreciate that. And I will say about my cast members, you know, people watch and they all have an opinion. Oh, Sandoval's this. Oh, Sheena does that. You know, everyone has an opinion on every single person. Mm -hmm. I love Sheena. I fucking hate Lala. I can honestly say my cast members who I'm lucky enough to also call my friends, Mm -hmm. they are good human beings. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. we all have our little things where it's like, "Eh, don't love that about you. 
And that's just part of being a human being. Right. You know? Yeah. But I can honestly say that group of people that I get to be friends with, they're just, their core is good. Yeah. I you love know? that. What a great way to feel about people you you surround yourself with. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. So I'm very excited for the reunion. I feel like it's going to go great. And what they do is the reunion comes and we get every single episode so that we know what we're going to be talking about. Because even though we lived it, we don't know what the episode entails, right? I love that. Yeah. And we don't know what everyone said about us behind our bags. Oh, so we have to so watch smart. it. Bravo, bravo. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Little Denise Richards. Bravo, bravo, bravo. <laughs> So I've seen a lot of the episodes, but last night, one of the episodes aired another one that didn't age so well <laughs> with what I was saying, but it was funny because did you see that part okay. where in my interview? So I haven't watched it yet, but I've been like peeking in when you're watching it. You guys, I'm still trying to get my apartment together. Lala is way more ahead than I am. Her house is like looking amazing. So I need to watch it, but tell me what I you should You mean you've expect. been doing other things besides <laughs> peeking in and watching Bravo? Like, what could you possibly be doing, Jess? <laughs> Working her ass off. She's such a hustler. I love her. Thank you. Um, the one part where it was like, <gasps> there are repercussions to no your ex- actions. You don't get to come home lay next to all this. Are you crazy? I saw that. And how do you feel about that moment? It just feels so weird. Like the universe yeah. was like, we're going to need to like make sure that she has some good interviews that kind <laughs> of align with what's about to smack her in the face. Right. Yeah. Also, amen to that. I did see that clip because I heard it as you were watching it and I peeked in. How do you feel about that? Would you say that same exact thing right now? Absolutely. Yeah. There are repercussions. Mm -hmm. Bye. I love it. I love it. Bye. What else? No questions asked. No questions asked. No questions asked. You know the deal in this relationship. I had my head in the sand for a really long time. Right. But I'm grateful no matter what. You know, what's five years and some change versus what I would have been in you know right for me it's like I give clear-cut things of what I expect in a relationship sadly it's sad that that you even have to say like I have a zero this policy and this yeah the second that I felt unsafe I always I said this in therapy I said the second I get a pit in my stomach it'll be a different conversation I got that pit Jessica Mm mm-hmm and I got the fuck out. Good for you. No questions asked. No questions Bye-bye. asked. Bye-bye. Here's my, here's my question. No questions asked, but also I have a question. Yeah. So I watch, so I saw that interview clip, and I thought, there's no way if I knew some things were going on, right. I wouldn't tell this this person. And th- this interview was not, it was a while ago. Or a, not, not that long ago, but it was... It was a while ago. It was so... My question to you is, you're this person in the interview and you're saying these things. Do you think that that also comes off to your friends and castmates? Or do you think like, do you look at that person in the interview and think, oh, people must see me differently? You know what I'm saying? You know, I ask that question all the time. Like what, how could this be going on? And I had no idea. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because I look at that person in the interview and that's who you are now. And it's a take no shit. Right. Don't even try and cross the line. Yeah. It's interesting. It's it's very hard for me to watch this season. Yeah. Very. Yeah. But you know what, Lala? You're the same person. That's what I'm like. It's not like this is how I feel. It's not like you're watching the show and you're like, oh, like... Sure, you say some things that didn't age well, but overall, you're not watching the show and you're like, oh, my God, I'm like cringing at what I believed in that right. moment or my morals or how right. I felt. No, you're right. When I when I watch it, it's like I was just someone who thought she was in a very different situation than she was actually in. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, The other part of last night's episode was mm-hmm. me. What is it called? Mimicking, mocking, impersonating, mocking. impersonating. Tam- oh my god! I saw, <laughs> I saw this clip too because I heard someone talking. I was like, "That's not." Wait, is that Lala? Is she imperson- <gasps> for impersonations on point? But tell me about that scene. 
I just could picture Sandoval so clearly in my mind. It's when I heard that they were making cocktails. And then the way that they edited it together, it was like, this is gold. It's one of my favorite edits besides <laughs> the bitch montage. The bitch montage <laughs> wins the whole game, right? Yes, that was incredible. Like you called it. You knew exactly, you called it. How did that happen? I'm just appreciative for the editors because yeah. the fact that they pulled that together mm-hmm. and how many seasons and times that I use the word bitch. Right. Bravo, bravo. Bravo, bravo. Bravo evolution. <laughs> bravo evolution. I dig it. No, but I love that. Your impersonation of Tom Sandoval is amazing. This, and you don't have to do it now, but if you were to impersonate anyone else on the cast, who do you think you would nail? Because I feel like you were great at Tom Sandoval. Who could you, who do you look at at the cast and you're you're like, oh, I could impersonate him or her really well? Because I have an idea in my mind because I've heard you do it before just as like being cute or funny. I think maybe Tom Schwartz or um, my sweet little Bambi Raquel. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to do it right now. No, no, no. Don't do it yeah. right now. No, but I just, because it was so, like, Tom Sandoval, I would have been like, no, you can't do that. But Tom then I Sandoval it. is the <laughs> easiest one to do. It was good. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Anyway, moving on to our important guest. You guys, I'm so excited for today's podcast. I know I say that every time, but the guests that I get to have on are so amazing. And today I have a woman who literally is responsible for the path that I am on today. She is someone I wrote about in my book. Her name is Dr. Stacy Cohen. She is the woman who I met with on a Friday over three years ago. And she said to me, I want you to take this number down after hearing me speak. And this number she had me take down was a substance abuse, basically a case manager. She helps get people sober. I said to Dr. Cohen, are you asking me to be sober? Because I can't do that. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm not asking you to do anything. I just want you to take it in case you ever need it. Cut to that following Monday. I used the phone number that she gave me. And she is just like, I'm so excited to have her on. We're going to talk about this time of year. It's supposed to be amazing and cheerful. And you have like, you know, your we have Hanukkah that's mm-hmm. happening. We have Christmas coming up. It's supposed to be a very enjoyable time, but it's very stressful. A lot of people slip into depression during this time. Mm -hmm. I am going to have her help us navigate through all of this and just shed a little bit of light. And again, I want us all to feel like we're bonded through this podcast because we all share a lot of the same struggles. That is the point of doing this podcast. So when we come back, we have... One of my angels, Dr. Stacy Cohen. We are back with a woman who really saved my life, Dr. Stacy Cohen. Stacy, I don't know if you remember this. You were the person that I had a session with, and you gave me a phone number to call because we had spoken about my drinking. And I said, are you asking me to be sober? And you said, I'm not asking you to do anything. I just want you to take this number in case you ever need it. That was on a Friday. And I used that phone number the following Monday. Of course I remember. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I just, so you, you're like one of my angels. I always say that. Um, And now we're going into the holidays And, you know, people like to drink, they like to be merry, but I know that a lot of my followers and listeners always wonder how to navigate because depression and anxiety, they don't care if it's Christmas or Hanukkah, they, it it comes as it feels it wants to. How do you tell people to navigate these emotions and, and I the illnesses that I struggle with, whether it's Christmas or not, you know, how how do we how do we navigate during this time? Well, I think you're exactly right. Depression and anxiety, they don't they don't uh, decide when to come, although they come oftentimes more frequently during the holidays, actually. Why is that? 
sometimes times that might feel the best are also the most stressful. Right. Um, you know, sometimes our highs or our ups or, you know, are, are also, you know, cortisol is released whether things are high or low, bad or good. When things aren't just kind of balanced, we get stressed. Um, so it's very common that anxiety and depression creep up during those times. It's also times where we're, we're triggered more. Um, we tend to regress and sort of be brought back back to childhood traumas and whatnot when we're around family because we're reminded of things from the past. Um, sometimes those are good things, but sometimes right. those are difficult things. So a lot of times people aren't aware of, of all these sort of reasons that we're propelled backwards um, or that our bodies are going to be more stressed and we're going to be more prone to things like anxiety and depression. Right. And I feel that same way. And it's so funny because, you know, I, I used to, I don't want to say I used to, I still love the holidays, but they obviously are not as magical as they once were, you know, like Mm -hmm. they're, they're just different. And, you know, now I have a family and I have the, the pressures and stresses of decorating the house and, oh, we have to get this person a gift. And it's almost like we lose what this time is really about, which is what I loved when I was a child. You know, I wasn't into really getting gifts. That wasn't my big thing. I loved, you know, the Christmas dinners that we went to and being around groups of people. But as you get older, like it's your job now to plan these things. And that is a lot of pressure. Do you find that a lot of moms or just women in general that are kind of in my age group, your age group that are like, this is too much? Yes, absolutely. And and it starts like a month or two before the holidays. It, it almost starts before um, Halloween. Really? <laughs> that early? Yeah, because people are first stressing about Halloween and then they realize that Thanksgiving is coming around the corner and then it's Christmas and and there's a lot of either travel or events or, you know, things to decorate for, get gifts for, thing, you know, everything you're talking about. It's a disruption in our routine. Right. And I've found that myself and people that are like me, we like our routine. We like our structure. And when things are kind of thrown off balance is when we start to spiral. Do you find that when during this time of year, I mean, are people, you know, double booking you? They're like, instead of one session this week, I'm going to need like four. (laughs) It's definitely the busiest time of year for us um, as mental health providers. And I think, you know, I think people lose track of a lot of the things that keep them well, like, for example, exercise, or meditation, or seeing, you know, the friends in our lives that help keep things together, maybe they're gone, or maybe we can't see them because we're traveling or whatnot. Those things that usually hold us together, we tend to lose sight of because we're busy doing other things. That makes so much sense because then you think about after the holiday for everyone's New Year's resolution, it's always like, I'm going to get back to working out. This is, I'm going to start meditating again. So we do kind of fall off the wagon a little bit. Absolutely. And our meals are very different. Our sugar intake is very high. All the pie in the world. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> I'm going into my first holiday in many years as a single mom. And that to me, you know, I, I feel like I should be a little bit more concerned about it. I'm actually feeling very peaceful. Who knows as, as the holiday gets closer, I may start realizing, holy shit. What advice, because I'm getting a lot of DMs since my life has kind of changed women that are going into their first holiday as single moms, or even if they're not moms, they're just going into a holiday without a partner. What advice can you can you give to me and and women that are in my same position? I think we have we need to take the wins. So if you're feeling good right now, celebrate that. Oh, I love relish in it. (laughs) Because I because there's going to be hard times. And then there's going to be good times and there's going to be hard times and there's going to be blah times. And this, I mean, the last few years, everything's been flipped upside down for so right. many people. So when you feel good, enjoy it. 
like let yourself enjoy it. You know, I heard you say like, maybe I shouldn't be feeling so good or maybe, right. you know, <laughs> let yourself enjoy it. Be in it, be present. Um, I, I know that, that when it's that. not that easy, it's also going to go away too, you know? <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of us sit here and when we're not worried about something, just the day and age we live in, it's like something's wrong. Why am I not worried about something? It almost feels like, wait a minute, like I, I'm bored right now, but the bored is actually me feeling good and I'm supposed to be stressed. And also I love what you said because this goes back to what I learned in my program of AA is that feelings and and places and all of that, is it's only temporary. Mm-hmm. I think that that's hard for people to remember. Sometimes we feel very stuck in it. Yeah. And I'm sure you have a lot of people that come to you and they say, how do I stop feeling this way? And and you're a psychiatrist. So you you have the ability to write prescriptions and things like that. Do you have people come in and you're like, you don't need a prescription. You're just going to come in here and we're going to talk because I don't think that we need to go that route. All the time. I joke that I'm taking people off of meds just as often as I'm putting people on <laughs> meds. Because the minute you tell someone you're a psychiatrist, like, oh, you're a shrink, you're the one with the prescription pad. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and I'm actually an addiction psychiatrist. So I see people who have become addicted to medications from other psychiatrists quite wow. often, which is wild. Um, so oftentimes the solution is not in the pills. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, and sometimes it is. it's a both and. You know, sometimes... Okay. There's really clearly something that will benefit from medications and you need to get your butt up and exercise. You need to go to therapy. You need to go to AA. You need to stop drinking. Right. All of those things matter. Yeah, exactly. Um, And sometimes the medication is life changing too. I don't definitely don't want to knock medications. It's just, that's what's so tricky about my job. You know, cardiologists, we know every little bit of the heart and what's wrong and how to fix it. We don't know that about the brain and the mood. You know, right. and the temperament and your body, it's all connected and it's so messy and it's so confusing. <laughs> well, I, I know the mind is a very complex thing and it can talk you in and out of a lot of different things. So w- during this time of year, if people come into you and they've never needed medication before and then all of a the sudden they're like, this is too much for me. Like, how do you navigate through something like that? Because as a sober person, there are times where... I'll be venting to my sponsor or somebody and like a friend and they'll say, you know, maybe at this time this would help. And because I'm sober and I'm very into my sobriety, I just feel like I would rather just talk to someone and we work through it that way. And I'm not knocking medication either. I've definitely been on anti-anxiety, antidepressants, got it. It is a lifesaver and life-changing for many people. But during this time, how do you say... You know, it's just, this is a situational depression. Right. Yeah, it really depends on the severity of the symptoms, the duration of the symptoms, um, how problematic they are for people's lives. Everything in this big book that that I don't really love, but that we use to diagnose things. But of course, no one ever fits the cookie cutter picture of a diagnosis. Um, But almost every diagnosis says, to the extent that it's impairing functioning, um, because we, we all, you know, get nervous, we get butterflies in our belly, we get, you know, our chest starts pounding, we are afraid to do things, but we don't all have generalized anxiety disorder. Anxiety right. is an important tool. It tells us what's safe and what's not. But sometimes it tells us that things aren't safe, but they really are. You know, sometimes there's a misfiring. Wow. Can I tell you, I've never, I've never heard that before. The first part where you said that there is a benefit to anxiety because there's it's it can tell us when we're safe and when we're not safe you know that oh, yeah. that feeling that we get in our chest that goes into our gut letting us know like something's not right wow i actually really love that i had i never even thought of it that way so it does sometimes play in our favor and what i'm wondering is you know, at what point does that usually go back to childhood trauma? At what point do you say, okay, this anxiety is now not on your side? This is now affecting your day to day life and you're thinking you're not safe in any situation? Right. Yeah. When it when it gets to that point of being excessive, um, where it's 
causing problems in our relationships, where it's causing us not to be able to do things that we enjoy doing, like people that won't leave the house because they're too anxious or they're always late or they won't make new friends or they won't talk to people in class or at work or they can't sleep or they can't eat. Um, so it's, it's truly like a bundle of criteria. And when you have enough that it's problematic, then we start to say, okay, maybe this would benefit from therapy. Therapy is the start when it's like mild to moderate, we start with okay. therapy. Um, and then maybe we move into medication and actually exercise can be more effective than medication. You know, I always said I don't work out for my body. That's kind of like the bonus. Yeah. I work out for my mental health because there's just something about it that makes me feel like I can take on the rest of the day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so with the state that we're in, because we went, we have been in, you know, lockdown for over a year, we're starting to come out of our shell again. I mean, I'm sure that you have had people show up in your office that are like, I don't know how to function out there anymore. I've, I've lost all of my social skills. Definitely. How do we get back to being normal? Like, what is your advice? You know, we, we walked into this slowly. You know, I remember we were all buying toilet paper we thought it would be like a two week thing, you know, and we were in and out, but we weren't really like super careful. And then all of a sudden people, you know, I have friends of mine who were spraying down their groceries before they were allowed to bring them to the house. <laughs> I mean, all sorts. I wasn't doing that, but people were doing that. So we, we all walked into this at different paces, um, but it didn't happen overnight. We started hearing about it and then we started getting a little scared. And then there were some like shocking you know, moments where we kind of locked down, but then we were out and then there was a, you know, right. a recurrence, then we're back in. And so it's the same thing with getting back to life. We don't just suddenly poof where, you know, life is how it was. We have to sort of step in slowly at our own pace and everyone's going to do that a little bit differently. Um, and we need to be kind to ourselves and gentle. Um, That's the and, hardest part. <laughs> yes, that is the hardest part because we might go, and it might not make sense to anyone. It's kind of like the whole boundary thing we learn about. We need to set boundaries and they may not make sense to anyone else, but they're for us and they make us healthier. You know, I might go to one thing and then not be comfortable the next day going to the other because I heard about Omicron on the news or whatever, you know, and someone might be upset. I was speaking to friends and they were upset because, you know, they found out their friends went to this wedding and then they didn't come to their house for the holidays. But you know what? It's, it's a one day at a time sort of thing. And we need to just be gentle. Be gentle. I, I, oh, it's so funny because I, I'm very good at preaching, not so great at practicing what I'm preaching. But there are times where I sit there and I do feel comfortable going to the mall one day. I got my mask on and then my friend is having a get together and I'm like, but I don't feel, I don't know that I feel comfortable doing that. You almost have to be careful what you're posting on social media because you don't want to have to explain yourself. But you're right. I think being kind to each other and just allowing people to get back into this routine that was really taken away. I mean, most of us, I know I did throughout COVID, which lasted, like you said, way longer than we expected. All I did was watch TV and and like feed my face, yeah. you know. So to ask me to go socialize with a group of people after doing that for over a year is like, oh, my gosh, we're back, you know, holiday parties. I don't even know what to ask people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. And and then we're also going through normal life. I mean, you had a baby. I had a baby. <laughs> Congratulations. You had Thank a baby you. girl as well. Yes, they're around the same age. Um, and we're going through all that too. Yeah. Uh, and, and everyone else is going through their own things too. You know, so it's, it's already hard. <laughs> um, and there, there are some gifts. I mean, we were, we were taught to slow down. We were taught we don't have to go travel and be everywhere and be everything and do everything. And life still goes on. Right. You know, we, we learned to sit still, <laughs> some of us. Right. I think that was the biggest thing is, for me, is being able to just be, which, you know, with how much is out there and everything is so accessible just like that to just have to sit with your own thoughts for a minute and be okay was actually very amazing. 
you know, I that's what I gained from COVID. And I just want to know you are a new mom and you're going into the holidays. You're a working mom who's solving other people's mental health problems. You're the solution to that. I mean, how do you navigate this time of year or any time of year with your job and being a new mom? Yeah, we're, listen, we're not immune just because we're helping people from from needing our own help. <laughs> so that means for me, that means meditation. That means exercise. I did yoga this morning in between taking care of my baby. <laughs> wow. Um, that means therapy. That means friends. For me, friends are huge. Yeah. Sleep to, when I to can. To kind of exit your day to day, have them get your mind off things. Yeah. And a lot of sleep. A lot of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and asking for help. <laughs> I think a lot of people get nervous to ask for help. Yes. Well, and it, it was, it became difficult, I think, for people during the pandemic to ask for help. Absolutely. Because it, it was like there was, there was, nothing for you to feel like was wrong. The whole world was shut down. And it was like, why am I feeling this way when, you know, on days that I was working, I would have prayed for this day to not be able to do anything. So it was kind of a mind fuck. Yes, absolutely. You know, on that note, I want to take a very quick break. We will be right back with one of my angels, Dr. Stacy Cohen. We are back with Dr. Stacy Cohen, we are talking about how to navigate our anxiety, our depression, just all of our feels through this time of year, a time that's supposed to be, you know, everyone's out skipping on the street, we're buying presents, kids are excited for Santa Claus, people are celebrating Hanukkah, lighting the menorah, and then you just sometimes sit there and go, why the fuck am I feeling so down when it's like the happiest time of year? So... Dr. Cohen and I are telling you guys, well, I'm, I'm just listening and taking note, but Dr. Cohen is helping us navigate through this time. So my other thing was, because we were talking about being kind to ourselves during this time. And I actually think at this time of year is when people get the most bitchy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that that happens when you have someone come in your office and you're like, okay, she is very triggered by the holidays. He is very triggered by the holidays. We've got to work through. Do you go back to like, why are you triggered during the holidays? I'm sure sometimes it goes very deep. Sometimes I'm sure it's as simple as like, this is just stressful, period. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with childhood trauma. I'm just stressed out. Yeah. I mean, I'm in my childhood. I'm still home for the holidays right now. So I'm oh, in my childhood bedroom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and very apropos of what we're talking about. <laughs> um, and my sister's family was here with her three kids. We were all under one roof, uh, for Thanksgiving. Was it chaotic? Totally chaotic. <laughs> but like the fun type of chaotic, because that was something I liked. But again, now we're grown women. But when I yeah. was a kid, I loved the chaos. Yeah. It's a both and. Right. I mean, it, it's like, you're excited to come home and see everyone. And then you, you like sort of have amnesia. You forget all the bad stuff that happens every year. And then you come back and it's all on your face again. And you're like, Oh yeah, this is why I left. <laughs> right. So do you stay through? I, I believe you're Jewish, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm here. So we had Hanukkah and then I have okay. to, I'm giving a talk in the Midwest. So I just kind of stayed here. So I'm here longer you just than stayed. usual. Yeah. And you have your daughter with you? Yes. Oh my gosh, you're like a rock star. And I too am a single mom, so I, I get it. Wow, I'm, you inspire me. It <laughs> you is inspire chaos. Me. And, you're, <laughs> and we sit here and we're like, how did we end up here? And then you go back to that moment. Oh yes, that is how. And then you have all the strength in the world and you just push forward working, you saving people's minds. You just do it. You inspiring you just, people. <laughs> I mean, I think that... The reason I love doing this podcast and the reason I'm so grateful to have you on is this creates a space for us to really talk about things that we don't normally talk about and creates a space for us to bond and be real and authentic because right now, the only thing we really have is our cell phones and we all know that social media is not real life. This is where I want people to come to hear real life. So that being said, I want to know your take because we were talking about how no one wanted, most people don't want to talk about 
their feelings and they don't want to ask for help. Do you feel like mental illness is still a taboo? I think it's getting much better. I mean, I was watching football. I don't even like football, but football was on <laughs> in the background of my <laughs> holidays. And there was a commercial where the football players were talking about their mental health. I don't know if you saw it. It was like, it was amazing. It was really amazing. I have chills about, so it was a commercial about them talking about their mental health. And yeah, and it was just about getting help for mental. I mean, it was just, I was, it was like a proud mama as a psychiatrist in a mama yeah. moment. I was like so happy to see, because I've seen, you know, a number of athletes struggling with mental illness, but to see it front and center, you know, for the world to see. Right. With these men there that are inspiring young boys that would never be talking about their problems. You know, it, it made me so proud and so happy. So I do think it's I have coming chills. out there. Yeah. It was that special. makes me, I, I'm so glad you shared that with me because I also do not watch football. Um, <laughs> so I don't think I ever would have seen that, but that sounds amazing. I'm so happy that they decided to put that in the forefront. Um, I, I realized that, mental health wasn't talked about as much as I thought it was. I grew up in a very open household and my friends were very open. And, you know, I just, that's the way I grew up. And I remember my second season on the show I'm on, I opened up about my anxiety and I just, I didn't think anything of it. I just kind of made a statement. I was upset that, you know, I was taught not upset that I was talking about it. I was just upset and and sharing my anxiety and the amount of DMS and just the response I got was overwhelmingly beautiful, but it was also kind of like, why are people saying thank you for opening up about this? Because I totally thought we were in a time where this was just like, let's talk about it. Let's be open about our anxiety and our depression and where our minds are. And so I wanted to get your take on that. And I also I agree. I think it used to be taboo, but things are getting better. And I also love that we're focused on the fact that it's these grown men who are athletes that are talking about their mental health. Yeah. I mean, that wow. A huge step. <laughs> a huge step. A forward. huge step. And how long have you been in this business? How long have you been a psychiatrist for? So I've been working independently on my own since 2013. I was in training for years before that. Wow. And and you have always done this in the Los Angeles area or do you travel and meet um, with I people? I did some of my training in Chicago. And then, yeah, I've been in LA ever since I started. And boy, oh boy, is it a big place to, to treat mental health and addiction. Oh my like gosh. I can only imagine because yeah, I wild. remember coming into your office that day. And, you know, I, I had come to the realization in that moment, quote unquote, I had just you know, decided for myself, you like drinking and that's okay. And you have fun. And once you get pregnant is when you'll stop drinking. Like that was my sick thought process. Yeah. It's very common. Is it common? Yeah. To think that. Uh huh. Wow. Well, it's kind of the, like when this happens, then I'll do, you know, it's, it's that sort of thinking. Okay. Okay. I could totally see that. And I'm sure that is there like a specific time of year? I remember at one of my AA meetings there, it was a huge one online and there were like 30 birthdays that were happening in October. And that's when I got sober. Is there a specific month or time of year that you can pinpoint where you're like, okay, this is when most people start realizing that they want to get sober? That's interesting. I mean, I, I think it's different for everyone. I, the holidays can be a time of more problems. So a lot of times after the holidays, you know, after the New holidays Year's resol resolution. Yeah. I don't know what that October situation was. <laughs> I didn't either. And I had asked my sponsor and she goes, yes, a lot of people get sober in October because they say that they're not entering another holiday season the way they used to be. Huh, news to me. That was news to me too. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so many gems in AA that we don't study because we're not really like allowed to as a right. sort of secret society that it is, which is, it's amazing. 
Um, no, I agree. There's so much to learn there. <laughs> there <laughs> I love that. But I could, I, I notice with some of my friends, you know, you, we live in LA, number one, there's something going on all the time, always an yeah. excuse to have a cocktail. It's like, it's a Monday at three o'clock and someone's having some freaking gifting suite with fabulous right. cocktails. And then the holidays roll around and it's like time to blow it the fuck out. Like we're like, we're drinking. That's just how it is. I remember last week we did an episode, me and my assistant, and she was asking me what my Thanksgiving tradition used to be. And I said, drinking, obviously. So common. People who struggle with alcohol use disorder, they will pinpoint exactly what drinks they had and what time of day and what they would drink for each holiday. They'll know. Of course. It's wild. It's yeah. wild. I can pinpoint like you wake up, you start with the coffee and Bailey's, then you graduate to the mimosas. Then as it starts getting to be lunchtime, you want your little Bloody Mary because that's, you know, more savory. I, I just remember it like it was yesterday. And now I'm going into my third holiday. Yeah, of, congratulations. No, well, thanks to you. I'm just like <laughs> you did it. I didn't do much. <laughs> I mean, you opened you opened that door, and I don't know if that would have happened for me without you. And sorry, I'm getting emotional about it. Um, I love that. <laughs> I'm beyond grateful for you. I wrote about you in my book. Oh, you did. You I did. Read it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, please don't cry. read it. Please don't read the book. <laughs> Just know you're in there and I'm forever grateful. And I'm so happy that you could do the podcast with me today and make people feel safe and like it's okay to struggle at this time. But we got this, everybody. We're going to go into the holidays and we're going to feel our feels and we're going to remember what Dr. Cohen said. Everything is temporary. Dr. Cohen, thank you so, so much. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so inspired by you. And honestly, the star power, I mean, one of the cool things about LA, as much as there's a cocktail at every event, there's also a sober person on every corner That's <laughs> and, very, there's, very and there's true. people talking about it. And I think the star power in sobriety is really incredible and helps a lot of young people, old people, people of all ages um, get sober because they hear people like you talking about it. So so proud of you and happy for you. Thank you so much. I'll let you go enjoy your day. Enjoy your gorgeous baby. And again, thank you so thank much. You. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Bye -bye. Cohen. Hey, it's Rich Eisen. And my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started. So why don't you come across the hall and take the chair and oh boy wait a minute i think I, I locked the door that's not a metaphor for anything how's the lighting in here i mean i'm vain you know so i thought for the first season try to bring you people i thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting and that's why i started off with jeffrey ross the comedian and then you know we've got a bunch of other asks out making paul rudd do it sorry paul do you know that you're doing it and i want this to be inspirational life is really hard right now and sometimes you just need a little bit of help someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say you can do this and i'm hoping that's what you're going to get from just getting started go follow just getting started wherever you get your favorite shows